I'm just going to do a very quick go through. We have a class scheduled for this next year on beekeeping. To become a hobby beekeeper, a lot of people don't really know the investment in becoming a hobby beekeeper. It doesn't take a lot of time. Normally, uh, in many parts of the year, usually harvesting will take some time and inspection of your hives will take some time. As your hives are growing, and when I say growing, you're splitting a hive or you're getting so excited that you're adding hives uh, to your, your apiary. I will say, I think it's six hives, any more than six or six and above, you have to register with the state. Okay, so if you want to keep yourself around five hives, you're good. Just like the ordinance said, you need to supply a water source. I'll tell you folks, there's very little opportunity for your bee or very little guarantee, sorry, your bee's going to hang at your water source. These bees can fly, fly five miles for their pollen and their nectar source, and they will do that. And it's pretty, I'm getting my factoids here. It, it, I've seen my bees around our water source at the environmental center. But when you have 60,000 bees in the summer in one hive, they're going to be going wherever they're going to be going. Okay. I don't know about you all, but I have seen a real big increase in honeybees this year. Uh -huh. I saw a lot at the Main Street event. It was really fun to see them hovering around. Not everybody enjoyed it like I did, but hovering around the recycling containers with all the syrupy cans. That's, it was kind of fun. But let me give you some quick factoids about these fascinating creatures. The queen bee can live for several years. Worker bees li live approximately six weeks during the busy summer and for four to nine months during the winter months. There's only one queen per hive, and the queen lasts about three to five years. Uh, all worker bees are female, but they are not able to reproduce. Worker bees live four to nine months during the winter, and I just said that. Nearly all the bees in a hive are worker bees. A hive consists of 20 to 30,000 during the winter and over 60 to 80,000 in the summer per hive. It's a lot of bees going on in there. All righty. Uh, to produce a single pound of honey, the honeybee must bring in approximately 75,000 loads of nectar. Did y'all get that? To produce a single pound of honey, the honeybee must bring in approximately 75,000 loads of nectar. That's why they only live six months in season. That's right. It's six weeks. Well, that's why you have 60 to 80,000 bees trying to bring that, that pound of honey in. Bees collect 66 pounds of pollen per year per hive. This is why they're so fascinating. I mean, I can sit there and just watch my bees all day. And Dennis, you might be doing that over there, Joe. <laughs> About eight pounds of honey is eaten by bees to produce one pound of beeswax. A hive of bees will fly 90,000 miles, the equivalent of three orbits around the earth, to collect one kilogram of honey. A honeybee visits 50 to 100 flowers during a collection trip. A bee travels an average of 1,600 round trips in order to produce one ounce of honey, up to six miles per trip. Bees from the same hive visit about 225,000 flowers per day. One single bee usually visits between 50 to 1,000 flowers a day, but can visit up to several thousand. The factoids are on the back table, so at break you can get a, there's more than that on this uh, list of facts, but it's really, really fascinating. But what does it take to become a beekeeper, a hobbyist? Well, equipment. That's really your most expensive part of becoming a beekeeper, is the equipment. You have the suit, and I have some uh, examples up here. You have the suit, the gloves, uh, the paraphernalia from the, the, the honey, the box, from the brood box and the supers. Uh, you, and then you want to start experimenting, like Dennis over here. And Dennis will be here at the break. He got in from frames, which are, have the foundations here. And then he got into the top bar <laughs> hive. And Dennis is a woodworker, so he started making his own hives. And just there's all kinds of opportunities out there in becoming a beekeeper. So equipment. By um, cost factor, gosh, I want to say if you're buying your hive already built, stained, and painted from Daydant, which is a company that's over 100 years old out of Chicago, they have an office in Paris, Texas, where they sell this equipment. 
oh gosh, I want to say a whole setup was about 300 bucks. And that was the brood box, one super, 10 frames, the queen excluder, uh, the feeding source, and then you add another $100 on for the outfit. So you're looking at about $400, $500 to get started. The what? Daydant. D-A-D-A-N-T. Daydant. It's E-T? D-A-D-E-N-T? Okay. A what? Can you buy like a starter thing of bees with a queen? Yes. Yes, you can. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Location. Well, as you heard from our animal services folks, you need to be aware of the location for your hive. Mowing, the bees don't care for that. They really don't care for your mower to be sweeping around them. So you really need to set yourself up an area where you can mulch it thick, you can put some pea gravel, you can do some things so that you're not having to get in there and mow, or especially weed eat. They really don't like that. Uh, they don't like the grass clippings flying into their opening. We keep them raised up here. They're not always raised. If you go out to see a, um, a bee, uh, a pollinator uh, that raises bees for pollination and they transport them, they have their hives all over. They have them sitting on pallets instead of up on cinder blocks. I like them up on cinder blocks because it's easier. I don't have to constantly bend too far down. And then you want to have enough spacing in between each one of your hives so that you can move around them. I try not to stand in front of uh, the hive here. That's the entryway and they're coming and going out of there. And you don't really want to block that. So I stand to the side or to the back. Okay, and this is a look at the entryway is here. That's their little landing platform. And this is a brood box. That's the big box. That's where the queen lives and all the brood. And then up above that, that's a super. And the super will come in two sizes, a medium or a shallow. A medium is obviously bigger and the shallow, shallow is smaller. A medium full of honey will weigh about 100 pounds. I think that's what it is, full of honey. It's 10 frames and then a shallow one, which is a little smaller, will weigh about 50 to 60 pounds, full of honey. Do they prefer sun? Do they prefer sun? Let's go back there. This actually is probably the, not the best positioning of the hives in the opening. The best position is for the hives to be facing east. So when the sun comes up, they're ready to go. These are facing west. There is partial shade here. Well, uh, the bees will still do okay. I mean, the sun, uh, they do fine in full sun. They'll do okay in partial sun. I, productivity in shade might be somewhat limited. I have noticed that in my hive. Uh, mine gets less sun than some of the other hives that are out at the environmental center. And so I have had less production. Now, that could also be due to the fact that I don't have, have a strong a queen. You know, part of your productivity is related to the queen and her uh, egg laying and because it all revolves around that queen. Everything revolves around the queen. It's all about her. <laughs> all right, there's my team. That was my startup. Uh, the gal on the far left and the guy on the far right, those are the people with the Texas Honey Bee Guild, also known as the zip code beekeepers. You might have heard about them. They have beehives all over the Metroplex and they do that specifically to have honey produced in various zip codes and they sell it accordingly. So they have three hives out at the Environmental Center and I have two. All right, grazing material. Your bees need some grazing material and they're gonna go wherever they wanna go. They fly, fly up to five or six miles around. So um, out at the Environmental Center, the honey has a very non-distinctive flavor. It's very sweet. So they're probably really nursing on all the floral and fauna that's in the immediate area that neighbors are the, the salvias and the sages and all those wonderful blooming things that are in the immediate area. There's plenty of it in the summer. The, um, the sunflowers that we plant out there every year, that gives them a source of material too to graze on. I have not had a very distinctive flavor, which means I can't tell that's a sunflower taste. I can't tell that's a 
clover taste or a lavender taste, but at some point and in some areas, of course, we have clover honey, right? That's because the bulk of the nectar and the food source is coming in from a field of clover or lavender. And in fact, when we were harvesting our honey this year, there was a couple before us and they have their hives around the peach orchard. Their t honey really tasted peachy, had a very strong peach flavor. There's uh, some more grazing material. The bees love it. All right, things to consider when you're a hobby beekeeper. Hold on just a second. Cost is number one. Location is another thing. You really want to have enough space. Now, not everybody has enough space. There have been hives that are up on rooftops. There have been hives that have been around apartment complexes. Uh, so there have been hives in very limited space areas. But also be conscious of where uh, you are, your neighbors. Not everybody is going to like having a honeybee nearby. Some of them are pretty petrified about having a stinging insect near them. <laughs> I've been stung one time. <laughs> I know Dennis has been stung a lot of times. We got video of that. <laughs> I've been stung one time and that was on my lip and that was bad enough. I got a little, little complacent going in and feeding the bees and just didn't take much, but that one died. So they, they sting you, they die, right? <laughs> uh, you want to allot some amount of time because you're inspecting the hive. You have to do that. You're looking for varroa mites or you're looking for um, uh, any conditions that may be bad, the, the American fowl brood or some, some issue going on. The queen died. There's a lack of, of uh, bees in the hive. You're looking for issues and you have to do inspect them. I and you don't need to do that all the time. When I started out, I wanted to look at my bees all the time. So I was always in there raising the lid and looking at them, and I was smoking them a lot too, and that really is disturbing them. You know, they get disoriented, and so I've really cut back on, on bugging them. <laughs> <laughs> and know your city codes. Of course, we're really, really lucky to live in a city that allows this much goings on related to urban farming. I mean, it's amazing. There are a lot of cities out there that will not allow honeybees. Uh, harvesting. Um, harvesting is a lot of fun, but it takes time. And we're completely suited up when we go in there. We do, if we have to, we'll smoke them. This last time we didn't. It was a lot of fun not to smoke the bees. Um, if you're doing them, as, uh, harvesting the honey about nine o'clock in the morning or 10, a lot of them have already gone out. They're out in the field and they're doing their thing. They're coming and going, so you're not having a whole mess of bees in there with you. But you know, it takes them a minute or two to understand what you're doing and they do get a little agitated and you can hear their sound. They ramp up and you can hear the, the buzzing just Then you know, okay, we better hurry up. Uh, splitting and expanding. We have not yet split our hives, so we're really looking forward to that. That's the question related to the queen and um, uh, requeening a hive, right? Well, for us, this is just my coming into my third year of beekeeping, so I have purchased my queen and my um, nook, which is four frames of bees and a matching queen from my instructor, my mentor, which is the Collin County Beekeepers Association. Um, so I'm giving you the website at the very end. If you want to become a hobby beekeeper, I would recommend going through their class. It was well worth it. I think it was $150. It was five months. It was one class a month and it was half a day and it was on a Saturday, way out in Josephine. But it was well worth it. Very knowledgeable people. Now they do train you more in a commercial side of things. You know, feeding your bees sugar water in the off time and, and that kind of thing. You can be like other folks. Uh, Dennis, he's been experimenting more with bringing the bee back into a more natural setting and maybe getting away from uh, the unnatural side of giving them sugar water and that kind of stuff. Okay, do you want to become a beekeeper? I would register. They have, their class has become so popular, I had heard they offered a third session. It started out with one, 25 people, and then they started two. Now they've started a third. They do register during um, the um, state fair. So they may be full now. They start in January, but I would go to the, their website, website and see if there are any openings if you're wanting to become a beekeeper. The smoker. Well, sometimes uh, as a beekeeper, and you should have this in your, your whole uh, cadre of equipment, this is a smoker. 
And I usually, if I'm really doing some inspections of the hive or if I'm, when I'm harvesting, I like to keep this nearby. Not that I'm gonna use it, but I like to keep it nearby in case I do have to use it. And it's just filling this inside with paper and I use pine, needle, pine needles or wood chips and it just <coughs> provides a smoke and the smoke disorients the bees. And so you're just lightly going to smoke the bees, enough for them to be distracted for you to, right. Right. Now, when I got stung on my lip, I knew at that time I had no protective gear on whatsoever. And when you're stung, that's a signal to all the other bees that there's something that shouldn't be nearby that's nearby, the enemy. And so they become alert, and you're alert, and the most immediate thing you want to do is go, ah, oh, you know. No. No. You uh, get out of your environment and pull that stinger out as quickly as you can, but don't freak out. Now, when we do lectures out at the environmental center, um, the bees do come around. There are some sweet smelling folk out there that attend some of our classes, and the bees want to know what that is. And so we just tell people to not worry about it. The bees are curious. They're not there to sting you. They're not the enemy. And don't swat at them. If it gets persistent, we have some off, and we'll spray it on folks if, they, if the bee is persistent about it. So, questions? So is that generally true? You, you're talking about, you know, that there are neighbors or whatever that'll be, you know, afraid of having stinging things around. But as far as aggressiveness or anything mm -hmm. like that, are they generally, if they're just going about their business, they may be near you, but, but right. you're generally not going to get stung? Is that just... Um, just... Disturbed or... Right, uh, and I'm going to have Dennis answer his side of it. Just from my personal experience with my bees, I have been really fortunate to have very gentle, docile bees. Um, I, from your standpoint, I think the only time that I've seen any kind of, I wouldn't say it's aggression, it's just defense, yeah. uh, from the honeybee has been if, when I'm on their turf and I'm doing something that they're not appreciating, <laughs> that I'm coming in and disturbing their, uh, their I'm invading their, their situation. I have not had any a, attack from a bee. That I've seen. Some of the things, you know, the predatory wasps and things like that will seem to be a lot more like you're just in the wrong place and they just come after you, you know. Well, that's different. Yeah, you know, that's a wasp versus the honeybee. Right. So right. I'm saying there is a difference there. They, they don't behave that way. No, or, not that I have found. No. Okay. Now, the bee out working will never attack unless you, type, unless you mess with them. I can go out into flowers and put flowers on my hands and let the bees climb all over mm -hmm. my hands. They're all about the flower. Bee will almost never go after because they'll die when they sing. They don't want to die, <laughs> obviously. But if you go into, the bees aren't aggressive, they're defensive. If you go into their house, just like in Texas, you come in my house, I'm going to shoot you. I won't die from the shot. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's been a, a real eye-opener to me. I mean, it's fascinating to, to watch them do their thing. I'm going to take two more questions, and we're going to get a fascinating story up here about chickens. And I, I know everybody's kind of ready for a break, but this is going to be a great story about chickens. Really quick. Are killer bees a problem anymore? I'm not in this area, no. I, I, they haven't moved this far north, and that's, the, that's what we get from our instructor, is that the killer bees haven't moved this far north, and they are coming up from the south. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. I would definitely let your neighbors know that you are uh, that you are starting an apiary in your yard. Right, just something for them to be aware of. Okay, but they don't attack you unless there is a reason for them to go to you. Real quick. I know there's a hive that I've been walking up to it. Uh huh. Normally it wouldn't bother me, but over August and September in there, they started stinging. It was a defense of the honey or what? They become a little more defensive in, uh, oh, in the wild. Well, in the heat. When it, the hotter it gets, the uh -huh. more defensive they become. Yeah, so okay. Very much for that. Kathy, come on up. Now, we are doing a full course on honey beekeeping. Uh, a beekeeper, becoming a beekeeper, and then I have some equipment up here afterwards. We'll be here. What? Do you have an idea of when in the year? June. 
Yeah, I like to do it sometime around harvesting time. If we're doing it out at the environmental center so you can see what a full super looks like. It's really cool. All right, now, this is Kathy. And Kathy, um, I, Kathy was introduced to me through a colleague. Kathy is a brand new, well, not brand new. You've been doing it what? Year and a half now. Year and a half chicken farmer. And uh, the gal that I had uh, or wanted to bring in to tell her story about chickens kind of backed out on me on the last second. And so I called Kathy and I said, and this is Kathy Duxbury, would you please tell your story? She's got the funniest story about becoming a chicken farmer. And she's also got some really cool show and tell. So Kathy, I'm going to turn it. We got to get you mic'd up, don't we? Need to get you mic'd up here. I'm going to mic you up. So everybody, welcome Kathy to the table. It's not pretty enough, Kathy. But no problem. Yeah. She's a brand new speaker too. Also, what do you think? Is that going to work? Yes, I do. <laughs> of Grawweiler, near Lively Elementary. Uh, she's kind of built me up. I don't know if this story is as great as... <laughs> I never intended to own chickens. Ever, ever, ever. Never crossed my mind. The only time I crossed my mind about a chicken was when the neighbor's rooster crowed. <laughs> my motto is, if it crows, it goes. That's just the way I feel about it. Uh, the neighbor has a rooster and he doesn't seem to understand that you're supposed to just crow at sunrise. <laughs> it's all day long crowing, very loudly crowing. And it's irritating when it first starts and eventually you'll get, you get used to the crowing, you know, you just kind of don't hear it anymore. But my husband was telling it at work that we had this annoying rooster and um, I guess they have a very odd sense of humor there. And one of the guys brought some hens. He was hoping there was 50, well, he brought 15. And he was hoping there'd be 15 roosters. <laughs> and he gave these to my husband, who I, I knew nothing about this. My husband knew nothing about it. It came and he came home and he had like a little toolbox and he's coming through the front door and he says, guess what I have? I, well, I have no idea. And it truly was just about this size. And he opened it and I'm like, oh my God, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> There's 15 little tiny chicks in this toolbox. I'm like, are you insane? And, and then he told me that the guy thought it was funny, he's hoping roosters to get even with the guy next door that has this annoying rooster that we put out with for so long and I'm like but the ordinance what is it and I'm going to the computer and I'm looking it up and I'm like but I don't want any chickens <laughs> and, <laughs> and then you see these little tiny little chickens and and there was no ordinance Irving wasn't on my side. I was like, okay, it must be meant to be. I'm supposed to have these chickens. And my husband, I'll build a coop. I'll take care of them. Yeah, right, that's like a dog and a child. And, uh, <laughs> but then I have also four grandsons and they were small and they saw the chicks and I had them in the summer for, four, for about four hours a day, two of my grandsons and they saw them. And believe it or not, the chicks are really like having a parakeet. You can teach them, you can just put your finger down, just like on a parakeet, it'll get up on your fingers. So will chicks. I never knew that. I thought you just hate them. Uh, <laughs> but my husband, he built a, cute, uh, a coop and uh, the kids grew attached to them. Of course I did. I didn't want to like them. How can you not? They're just precious little things. And then when they're about six months old, they give you an egg. They kind of pay you back for like, look what I got for you. You know, yeah. I'm not so bad. And uh, that's how I ended up with the chickens. I was, and <laughs> 
But I didn't realize that they're so sweet. If you treat them good, wow. It's just, I never would have believed anybody that said a chicken could be a pet. And there's nothing like having 15 little faces run up to you every time you come outside, they're excited to see you. <laughs> it's just like you are just it. <coughs> and when you, if you come home, my husband goes out and he's walking around the yard and, he, and I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, I'm relaxing. They all gather around him. If he walks, they follow. <laughs> they don't know they're not ducks. They just follow him. If he's in the shed, they go in the shed. They're, they're very curious creatures. And uh, I have, I just never knew that I would go so far for a chicken. I mean, I would do anything for my chickens. And I learn as much as I can. Most of it I've experienced just by, oh my gosh, what would I do? Like the hot summer that we've had. Uh, they don't produce very well in the hot summer. I was lucky to get three eggs. Yes. How many roosters did you wind up with? I didn't get a rooster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had to write these down. I have a hard time pronouncing one of them. Uh, I have Buff Orpingtons, Plymouth Rocks, and Rock Island Rock, uh, Reds. Just two of those. I'd like to show you what uh, the Rock Island Red, the Reds did. Well, these are, and I'd like to pass them around. If you, don't, if you break them, nothing will happen. And she'll be upset because I brought them for Fran. But this is, <laughs> this, is, this is her dozen. No, she said pass them around, so that's okay. But just when you think you've seen it all, maybe some of you have seen this. I never. I almost passed out. In fact, I'm surprised the chicken didn't pass out. But it's the same one that you'll see in the carton. She did three of these. Wow. That was from the Rhode Island Reds. <laughs> and she didn't even scream. I mean, and well, I've just had, I've had three since owning them. I, I didn't know when I opened up that this would be like, I'm like, it can't be, I can't be seeing what I see. And then of course I looked it up and there's world records of chickens that lay eggs like this in Guinness Book of World Records. Excuse me? Are they good eggs? Yeah, absolutely. There's two to three yolks in them. You could have an omelet. The third one broke because they stand up when they lay the eggs and it cracked when it dropped. It was the largest. But it, it, it did crack, so I just carry around, and I don't want to eat it. <laughs> but to show you the extreme that they can go to, that was hers. But this was hers, too. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> How perfect. That's just, and it's, there's a yolk and everything in here, just like the ones you're going to pass around. The same chicken did all of those eggs and these. Oh, absolutely. You do not need a rooster. You need a rooster to, to have chicks. <laughs> you don't need them for any other purpose. Although some people believe you need them to protect your chickens. I put them away in a coop at night. I like free range chickens. Mine go where they please in the yard. Uh, we just put them in a coop at night to sleep. They know where it is. They go to it. They're spoiled. They wait for us to put them in the coop. They they could go in by themselves. They have done it, but they prefer not to. They prefer to wait for us to put them to bed. <laughs> and we do it, yes. So you guys have to put, put them to bed, so to speak, every night? Yes. Look forward to it. How big is the chicken that lays in Yes, sir. Have you had problems with cats? No, that's why we lock them up at night in, the, in their coops. How big of a coop do you need to keep all these chickens? Well, I haven't really measured it but uh, not much room at all because they really, they like to be very close together when they're sleeping. You, you know, you put a post across and then even if they had tons of room, they'd still gather on it and beside stuck together. It's just very odd. 
It's like you have all this room. Why do you need to be crowded like that? But I, I'd say it's about like this, if that makes any sense. I don't know measurements, but it's about like that, where they can go in and lay their eggs. They also lay their eggs in their coops. But it's open for them to go in and out at will. They just go back of a day after we've let them out. My husband gets up at 5.30 unless the chicken's out, even on the weekends. His choice, it isn't like they couldn't wait. But uh, that's just, they don't need a lot of room. How big of a yard do you have? Well, I don't know measurements. I have a good sized backyard. But I will tell you, you will have a lawn that looks like a golf course. <laughs> you sincerely, it is absolutely, except this past summer wasn't so great. But right now they will start what I call little rotor tillers with their feet uh, digging. And I t first time I saw that, I'm like, okay, we're not going to have any grass. We're just going to have dirt. And my husband kept saying, I promise you, the grass goes really, really deep, and it's going to come back. And I'm like, yeah, right. We got dirt. And then come spring and everything, and I have the most gorgeous grass. And this past summer, when we had no water, I wanted to kind of put them on a leash and take them around to the front yard. But, you know, I don't know. I don't think there's an ordinance against putting a chicken on a leash. I don't, I don't think so. But I have thought about taking them for walks. But I couldn't pick up all the droppings. <laughs> they, they go about every five minutes. <laughs> but, but I have taken what we clean up around back. You can rake it up. And we went and we put it on the front yard. And the days that we were allowed to water, now I have beautiful front yard grass. Are cats an issue? Do they come around? No, sir. I don't allow that. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I read online in one of the blogs, you know, I don't know anything about chickens, and <laughs> someone commented uh, that it would be cheaper to go to Walmart and buy the eggs than it would be to raise a chicken and tend to them and feed them. Do you, do you agree with that? Yes, I agree with that. I don't, I would say that it's not. I was going to say, you can't pass that up. Right. How do you pay for that? And I have actually thought of going and buying their so-called organic egg and tasting it. I haven't done it because I don't like the price they put on their eggs either. Uh, do I have to feed my chickens the way I do? Absolutely not. There's, my husband says I spoil them, but so does he. <laughs> they, they, I mean, I buy grapes for them. I found out they love grapes. I was eating a grape. I thought, oh, what the heck, let's just see. They love grapes. They love raisins. They love, love watermelon. <laughs> pumpkins now. The seeds inside the pumpkin is a natural uh, worm killer. You can deworm them. It's all natural. So it's what you want to do. 80% of a chicken's food is grass. It's what you want to buy for feed. We feed them corn and we feed them feed. We don't have to give them corn. I'll also give them a can of corn. They don't get leftovers. I cook them rice because I choose to cook them rice. They don't get rice left on my table. I cook them a bowl of rice. It's cheap. You can get a big bag of rice because it makes me happy. They love to see me come outside. It's like always take a little something with you and they'll just love you. Yes, ma'am. Um, how do the chickens react to the weather extremes that we have here in Texas? You know, the ice and snow we had back in February and this past summer. Well, they'd prefer the, the cold weather to the summer, I can assure you. And I, I struggled with, I just did, couldn't bear the thought of them dying from the heat. Uh, so I, I spent a lot of time, I froze Coke bottles and put them inside their water, because it was as tall as, taller than a Coke bottle, the two liter bottles. And I would freeze them, and then it kept their water cold all day long. And then if I saw them seeming like they were struggling when it really got hot in the day, 
then I would take the water hose and mist them, not wet them, because you can, they can die from that. I spent a lot of time doing that. I didn't lose a chicken. I've never lost a chicken. So you don't run them with your fans and the air conditioning? Absolutely. And no, no, I put, they're in shade. I, you wet down, like there's an area of dirt that they've got just dirt because they take dust baths, as it's called, to keep the insects off of them. And it's just natural. You wet it down, they will lay on the dirt to keep cool. And, and I was some real fancy, fancy, fancy cubes out there. And uh, there is an annual, isn't it an annual coop tour in Dallas? I think, I think they run that in April. Uh, actually, we talked to the, the people who are involved in the environmental movement and, and food movement in Dallas begged them to move it to May because we are so overwhelmed oh, in April with Earth Day. We have something, 10 things a day. So next year it'll be in May, but it's a, a great tour. It is a really fast. <coughs> All right, we got two more questions over here. over here. I'm wondering, I know I've heard people, what about the cats, what about the cats? Do, do they stay in your backyard? Do you clip their wings? Do they fly into the neighbors? I mean, as far as containment area, because I do have a colony <laughs> of, of feral cats, and then we also have dogs. But can, is there a protection issue that you have? Do they stay contained in the area? Yes, and we clip their wings. And I have fat chickens. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> yeah, well, mine couldn't get off the ground, actually. They're pretty heavy, but yes, we clip their wings. Because they can get up on the meter that's at the back, and they can do it when they were skinnier. But they, they're plump. I, I actually would recommend a... Uh, some sort of chicken wire well, or something over the yeah. top because I've had friends lose uh, hens to hawks. Yes. And, oh, yes. Uh, yes. yes, we do have hawks. So I would really recommend, if you're not there to supervise, I would have an area that has a, a closed top. Oh, okay. And I have one building kind of structure to hold the chickens. Make sure you keep it under six foot because code enforcement regulates any kind of structure over six foot. They need to mention long, deep, wide, or high. So Keep it under six foot. And I'm glad she mentioned hawks because we had a hawk try to pick up a cat the other day in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So we we have hawks. I've just <laughs> not personally had those issues. Okay. Fishing line, run some fishing line out between the trees instead of just putting a little big netting. Oh. It'll keep the hawks out. Man, I was going to ask how oh, for the chicks when you let them oh believe me I watch my chickens a lot I because that's what I do but where they could not walk through the fence into the neighbor's yard is how tall they had they did they were not very old when we, when we could let them out three months. But, but we lost them while they were still small, and we don't know where they disappeared to. They were too small to get out and they run. It could have been a snake, too. Uh, my, my parents have, uh, have poultry and everything from hens, ducks, geese, and they're different predator are snakes. And so the chicks and little ducklings will get eaten by snakes. Our next speaker is Mary Karish.
Okay, now uh, remind, remember, I haven't met folks, so I'm really happy they're here. Mary is a master gardener. I'm just going to let you tell you about yourself. From the Coppell Community Garden. No. <laughs> I have her handout. Hey, it's close. It's Coppell, though. It's gonna... Anyway, Mary, I'm giving it over to you, and I'm going to hand out your handout. <laughs> Uh, thank you folks uh, for coming here. Um, it is always good to see uh, people who are interested in uh, sustainable practices. Uh, Fran was not too far off. I am a uh, master gardener with Denton County. I also garden with Coppell Community Garden, so I do have several hats. Um, and I love citrus, so I am a citrus specialist as well as a master composter. And people usually uh, ask me, well, how did the story go? I mean, when did you start gardening? Um, I'd say probably when I was still in my mother's womb. And the reason I tell you that is um, uh, I come from uh, a small village up in the mountains of Lebanon. Uh, if not heard of Lebanon, is, uh, it's in the East Mediterranean. And uh, in my village, people grew two types of crops. One to feed themselves and their animals, and the other one to feed, um, I mean, one to feed themselves and their uh, families and one to feed the, their animals. We didn't have grass, as you can see why, because it's very much mountainous. Now, if grass ever made it uh, anywhere, we would just send the goats after them <laughs> and uh, they'll take care of it. And uh, we, uh, in my village, nobody owns a lawnmower. And actually, I think if somebody saw one, uh, right now they probably think it's a vacuum cleaner. So uh, when we moved to, uh, my family and I, we moved to uh, Coppell, you know, obviously we wanted to buy a house and, and whatnot, and we bought a nice house uh, because for me, the kitchen was big and that's my center of operation, I love cooking. Um, I didn't pay much attention to the yard because, you know, that's what everybody had. And I figured, well, if everybody had the same yard, then there's something special going on. <laughs> and um, so, I waited to see what's so special about the yard. Well, after going through a whole season, um, a whole year, I decided I have three issues that I was facing. First of all, I'm lousy with directions. So sometimes I walk out of my front yard and, uh, and go for a walk. I find myself lost because uh, the yards look the same and the houses look the same. <laughs> And when you try here for me in America to ask people for directions and they tell me north, east, south, and west, I give them the southern, stair, southern mile stare because where I was raised, we go with landmarks. Um, you know, the house with the red shutters or if you've gone beyond Tanya's donkey, then you've gone too far. Um, <clears throat> so I decided this is a problem for me. I want my yard to be something different. And the second issue I faced as well is that after waiting a whole year uh, for something special to happen, nothing happened. Except in the summer, my water bill going, went up, <laughs> and in the winter time, the grass was dead. And third and final issue that I faced is that I go to the grocery store to buy my vegetables, and I was paying exorbitant prices for wilted lettuce head. And, uh, you know, being of Lebanese origin, uh, we need our uh, salads every day. And, uh, a wilted head of lettuce was not gonna work for me. And I would come back and I see, I have a yard that's uh, not as wasted and nothing is, is coming out of it except looking at grass. So finally I decided, well, I need to do something um, with it. Now I did not have goats, unfortunately, so I did the next best thing. I went and collected cardboard from the neighbor's trash and sl 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 slowly started um, filling it from inside all the way down to the, uh, to the street with cardboard. And I put a heavy area, a heavy uh, load of compost, mixed it up with the expanded shale, as well as with grass clippings and uh, leaves that I also collected from my neighbors. And I left them for like three months. During that period, as you know, the cardboard would de decompose and then the, the, the earthworms will find their way into the area that I've created and it was ready for planting. And uh, today, that is my front yard. Um, this is, um, again, people ask me, well, what does your front yard look like? And I ask them, well, which season are you asking me about? Because it changes every season. Um, I plant whatever is in, in the season. And that, for me, gives me great pleasure because I never get bored. 
And what, what's so special about it is that I am eating from it as well as I have planted some ornamentals. So I did a combination of edible landscaping as well as um, ornamental landscaping. The reason I did that is because I want the bees to come to pollinate and uh, also wanted to attract beneficial insects uh, to come and uh, camp out in my yard. And my favorite pets are actually the green lizards. I, I love them awesome. Um, so basically, even as of last week, I harvested my sweet potatoes. And uh, I don't know about you, but I like to plan Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving for me is not complete without my sweet potatoes. So how it really went. Um, the first thing that I will always tell people is that you need to compost. And it's irrespective of what type of uh, soil you have. If you compost and use compost for your soil, it will address any issues, whether you have a clay soil or if you have an acidic soil or a sandy soil. So I don't care if you live in El Paso, you live in Tyler, you live in Dallas. If you use compost to address your, your soil, uh, basically you will have very good results. It doesn't matter what plant variety you have. It's not the plant that's gonna make it, uh, make a good harvest. It's basically, it's everything starts with the soil. And this picture is I took from the Capel Community Garden. Every week we have a group of volunteers who uh, turn these compost piles. And uh, these are basically chicken, um, uh, chicken wire coops, you know, basically that you usually, if you go into a master composting class, they usually come with it. And in Coppell, they had a class and uh, I attended, made my husband attend because I wanted to get his, um, uh, his, his mesh as well. Yes, it was a good investment and uh, why not? So I compost at home and this is what we do here. And nice thing about compost is that you can do it for free. Uh, you don't have to buy anything and basically by salvaging the, your neighbor's grass clippings and uh, leaves that are destined for the landfill, just use them, layer them with a bit of water and you will have compost. And in fact, if you turn this compost bin every week, you will have a compost ready to go in two weeks. But I usually, we turn it once a week, so in six weeks time, we have compost that is ready to be uh, used. And I love the fact that it is free. And why I also enjoy it is because we emulate nature. Uh, if you go to the forest and you see these huge trees, you don't see a landscape designer or uh, somebody there tending to it. The forest composts itself. Uh, when the leaves and the fruits fall into the ground and then they decompose, they provide nutrients for that tree. And nature does not like wastage. It's a kind of a cycle of life. You know, what's, uh, what you put in the ground comes back into the tree. And if we emulate nature, uh, nature will appreciate that and will give you, you know, harvest, you know, tenfold more than that. Now, <clears throat> these, I wanted to uh, highlight some of the amendments that you would also use eventually when you do with compost. Uh, most of them are in the handouts that um, uh, Fran had handed out, uh, so they are there for you. Um, and I always, always on the top list, I always tell people, do you have compost? And people say, I, you know, my garden is so-and-so and my soul and so-and-so. The first thing I ask them, do you ever use compost? The next one that I would highly recommend is expanded shale, especially in our area because it is, the soil is predominantly clay and it likes to stick together. And expanded shale, you can find it in almost all of the nurseries. And it looks like, you know, a bag of tiny pebbles. But these tiny pebbles are actu actually magical because uh, they're, they're hollow on the inside. And when you water, uh, the moisture goes into those pebbles and then slowly it releases it into the soil. And what is good about it is that it also aerates the soil and you only add it once in the lifetime of the garden. Not like compost, you have to add it, you know, at least twice a year. Expanded jail, you just add it once in that lifetime of the garden and that is it. The next thing is that we also recommend our minerals. Um, just like human uh, plants are living beings, just like us. Um, it's not enough that you eat protein, carbohydrates, and fat. You also need minerals because that aids in the absorption of nutrients. Same thing goes with plants. They need the iron and the magnesium and the calcium. And also minerals, you uh, add them usually twice a year, and it really depends how heavy is your area being used. If you use plants that are heavy feeders like tomatoes and peppers, or some of them, the Coriciferous families like um, cabbages and cauliflower, you need, to add, uh, the, um, you need to add these minerals so that it replaces what the other previous plants have used. Um, again, I also want to emphasize that I do not um, uh, support or endorse any specific product. I'm sharing with you what I've learned, what worked for me. 
Uh, if you want to go buy a different product, that's up to you. But it's not like this product is better than the other one. Um, and also wanted to show you some of the more nutrients that we use. Uh, the one on the right, this is liquid seaweed. Um, this uh, product has been known for thousands of years among many civilizations. Uh, the Mayan civilizations, the Native Americans, the Phoenicians, the Romans, they all used liquid seaweed. And what usually are, you're getting is that the kelp that you get from the sea that you see washes around the shore or the muck from the bottom of the river. And it provides immediate availability of nutrients to the plants because it's in liquid form. It doesn't have to wait for the fertilizer to break down that you apply. It, it has an immediate boost on it. And um, if I always tell people, if civilizations were built on organic products such as these, why are we using Roundup today? They didn't know Roundup, you know, 2,000 years ago. But yet they were able to build, you know, really wonderful history that we still to this day, you know, look forward to what happened in the past rather than trying to figure out what might happen in the future. The other component that I like to uh, use is molasses. And, you know, with molasses, it's sweet. So when a plant is in stress, it is very good to add some liquid molasses. There is the granule one as well, but it takes a bit longer to break. This one is readily available for the plant to absorb uh, the sugar. And it releases stress on the plant, and as well as it improves the organic material in the soil. Because if you decide for some reason you cannot compost, and you need compost, um, you'll end up going buying it yourself, which is fine. But the compost that you buy um, from uh, the nurseries, it is very much sterile because it was heated at very high temperatures. So the uh, micro, or, uh, micro uh, organisms that were in the compost you know, are dead. So to revitalize that, you will need to add also molasses. The, also, the other part is um, the other things that I also said in my earlier slide is talking about leaves and grass clippings. Now, these are also for free. And I use them, um, I mix them in the soil, but I also use them as mulch. I've never bought mulch. Um, I, I believe in, you know, just go out there and get it. And, and free is nice as well. And why is it is important as well to use it as mulch? Because if you leave the soil bare, you know, other things are going to go into that soil. And nature does not like to be naked. So if you leave your soil bare, nature will fill it up for you. And sometimes you may not like her choices. And for me is when people say, well, I'm weeding all the time. I say, I never weed because if you mulch, you know, heavily around your plant area, you will not have any weeds because there's no room for the weeds to grow. And on top of that, you uh, will keep you the, um, the, the soil moist because uh, microorganisms like moist soil. If you dry it up, then there's nothing for them to go and they'll go somewhere else. And that also puts a stress on the plant when it is dry, because you're not going to be sitting there at 100 degree temperature with a watering can watering all the time. So you need to have to be efficient. The other thing that I also recommend are coffee ground. Okay. And um, again, it is free. Just go to any Starbucks and tell them you want the coffee grounds. It's a natural fertilizer. And because it came from uh, the earth itself, uh, it has no harmful effects, um, no matter how much you use. And in fact, if you have roses, uh, they would love the coffee grounds. And you will be amazed at how much they bloom um, vibrantly. So coffee ground is, again, free, and it's a very good fertilizer. And, and you know, if you like coffee, you walk, walk out in the morning and you smell coffee, uh, you know, in your garden, that tastes, that would smell good. <laughs> uh, again, I mentioned about liquid uh, seaweed and molasses. Now, the next big question is where to plant. Uh, most people, especially novice gardeners, uh, they assume that, well, you know, they don't have a green thumb because they planted something and it failed. But almost nine out of 10, I find out that it basically they planted their plant in the shade. They have a spot that's not used. The grass doesn't grow there, so might as well throw in a tomato plant. But nothing happens. Plants, so especially like fruits and vegetables, they're destined to be in the sun. So unless you have an area that at least it receives six to eight and preferably morning sun, then you're not going to get res good results. If you have a shady area that would like to fill it in, there are wonderful shade plants that would be very forgiving and actually they will bloom and prosper if you leave them in that shady area. So don't try to force things that just don't work just because you have a, a bare spot. So we have to be realistic in our choices here. Now, 
I want to move into uh, designs. You know, people say, well, okay, let's suppose I have a space and I want to, um, you know, garden it. What do I do? Now, this one is okay, taken from my front yard, and um, I basically practice freestyle. I don't have a specific style. I just like to emulate nature. Um, and then I mix, like I said, the edible as well as with ornamental uh, plants because it gives a nice feel to it. And I love color. So, I mean, this picture you can see I have larkspur because that was taken in the, uh, in the spring. And then I have the, my beans uh, here as edging. Um, this is one example of uh, a landscape design, you know, which is basically whatever you feel good about it, just go out and do it. The other one is raised beds. And again, this is taken from a community garden up in Denton. Um, raised beds is great if you're in a hurry. Uh, you don't want to wait for, you know, three, four months for the soil to break, break in and get to all the nice microorganisms in it. You can bring the compost and just put it on raised beds and you don't have to worry about what's underneath it. Now, if you decide to go with raised beds, I urge you to consider using cedar um, wood that is untreated. Many times we just go to home leavers and say we find these, uh, you know, these uh, planks of wood and we'll use them. Please be careful because those that were treated, they're meant for building. And uh, once you water, you know, if there's any arsenic in that wood, it's going to leach into the soil and it's going to leach into your plant. And it's going to end up in your system as well. So if you decide to go with raised beds, make sure that they're made from um, cedar. And nice thing about raised beds, actually, if you have several, is that you can keep in mind, you know, what you planted the first and the first one, the second one, and the third one. The second one is containers. Um, and this is gaining some popularity in Texas, but again, it has not really been very successful because a lot of people tend to um, plant things in very small containers. And in 100 degree temperature, there's not much room for the plant roots, um, you know, to grow and to stay moist. Again, unless you, um, you're prepared to water several times during the day, I would recommend nothing below five gallon containers for like pepper or, or eggplants. Tomatoes, they need 10 gallons. Uh, this is after I've tried, I've experimented with container gardening just to see what works and what does not. And after even experimenting in the summer here with the tomatoes, I found that 10 gallon containers for tomatoes would do okay. Um, again, I recommend if you want to use containers, if you can have like those whiskey barrels, uh, they're good. But the problem with that is that when you get to 10 gallons, you can't really lift them and you can't move them. So if you have a balcony and decide you want to grow your own things in containers, make sure your decision is final. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have to, you know, rent a dolly to be able to move. And in this picture, we have these are potatoes, um, you know, growing in these containers. Potatoes are okay because the roots are not that... Um, Deep because basically you're harvesting uh, the, the nodules of the roots of the potato. The next one is the square foot gardening. And again, this one is taken up in Denton. And this really is uh, um, convenient if you like to garden, but you don't have much time um, and you don't have the space uh, for it. And it is similar, same concept as raised uh, beds, except that you, you have a, a, you know, a four by four or an eight by eight uh, square foot. And each square, you know, you can fill up with a type of plant that you want. Now, obviously the bigger the plant, the, the more space it will, will, uh, will occupy. So if you take one, uh, one square, which is like this one here, uh, you can plant probably four lettuce heads which you can cut the, the leaves, you know, throughout the season. But if you decide to, uh, you want a cabbage or a cauliflower, then it will be one plant per, per square. And uh, also on the right side, as you can see here, uh, you can put a trellis. And with that trellis as well, you can have uh, any of the climbing beans uh, that you can. And nice thing about beans, they don't take up much uh, space because they, you know, if you provide up, then they will go up as well. The other one is what I call easy gardening, and actually this is gaining popularity with some hospitals uh, as well and with uh, senior centers because you can um, stack it up as high as you want up to your waist. If uh, people have uh, problems with mobility um, or have back pain, uh, it is very easy because you don't have uh, to bend. And in, um, uh, in hospice centers as well as in hospitals, it is great for patients who would come out and just be have some contact with nature and they'd be able to garden even sitting on a wheelchair and they don't have to bend. 
And again, it's the same logic as raised beds and square foot gardening, but in, in, instead of just bending, you're doing it either standing or uh, seated. Now, the only problem with that, of course, is the, the cost of the wood because it's going to be prohibitive. But I've seen people you know, doing it with concrete um, as well. Um, with tires, uh, I am, there's a bit controversy about using old tires because, again, you know, the material that might be leaching into the soil as well as the plants. And this is what I call designer style for me, because it's just there, um, and it just used, used the surroundings in a natural way. They didn't go into a fancy landscape design. And I also, one word of advice is don't let uh, fear of design scare you. Um, if it's something that works for you, just go out and do it. And if you still don't have any room to garden, um, this guy, his name is Felder Rushing. He's a retired... Um, 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 extension agent and he travels around the US and um, two weeks ago he was in Coppell and he pulled in with his truck and he lives in Mississippi so he actually drives his garden around with him <laughs> and um, not only he likes to garden but he also likes to landscape as you have seen he uses uh, um, you know colored bottles um, you know and and this naughty little frog uh, so um, <clears throat> and I thought to myself you know I, I told him so I mean the plants don't they get um, bitten by the wind I mean with howling and he says no I have an official document from the state of Louisiana that I, although I was doing 81 uh, miles an hour I my pepper plant was still okay so. <laughs> Uh, so I always tell people, don't whine and tell me I don't have a room to garden. If this guy can garden his truck, anybody can. Now, and um, that's one thing that I also wanted to report here. It, please don't do this. <laughs> I, I would certainly report you to the plant protection services because, I mean, plants are not meant to be cut and raised and shaped like that. I mean, if I were a plant, I would just, why bother? You know, just, just shoot me and put me out of my misery. Uh, plants are not meant to be that way. I mean, if you want a statue, go out to you and get yourself a statue. Uh, let plants be plants. Just like kids, let kids be kids. Okay, now moving on to um, um, other, um, other th issues that you need to consider with uh, gardening. I also would like to throw into this idea of harvesting your rain. And, and this guy here, he took one of the, you know, pickled uh, barrels and he cleaned it up, co colored it, and he uses his rain barrel, you know, to water his, uh, his garden. Now with that, of course, if you don't have a pump, you have to remember that you can use your soaker hose because there's not enough pressure. But I love the fact that he has rain barrels all over um, his house and he just collects the rain and rain is free. Again, I always like to emphasize that gardening, it does not require a separate budget, that you have to break the bank to get a garden. You can be very inventful and you can use the resources that are around you uh, to plant a garden. Now, okay, now a lot of people say, well, gee, okay, now that we've seen all these nice pictures, um, what should I plan? What should I do here? And I always tell people, if you live in Texas, do like the Texans do. And if you're in, uh, in Massachusetts, do the people and live in Massachusetts, don't gra try to bring a cherry tree from Washington and try to plant it here. Probably Home Depot and, and Lowe's, they probably will have it because most of the time, these things are ordered by people who never gardened in their lives. And if it looks good in a catalog somewhere, they'll bring it here. And unfortunately for a lot of people who are not familiar with um, Texas weather or never gardened before, they buy what looks good and then they watch the plant die in, in no time at all. So if you want to plant and, and um, garden in Texas, make sure that you are using something that is suitable to our climate. And I do consider Texas to be a great state because it is one of the few states that you can garden all year round. Uh, up north, once uh, September comes, you know, everybody packs up and ready for the winter. And there's no planting going on. But in Texas, the, the fall um, season, when you plant uh, things, it is uh, great because uh, you will have all winter to uh, harvest vegetables that will come right from uh, your yard. And basically, I've, I've done like an, a rough timing as to when you want to start planting for the spring and the summer and when you want to start for the fall. And again, I reemphasize the issue with the sun. For fruits and vegetables, you need direct sun. <coughs> and the other thing that I also want to want you to remember is that whenever you plant, you always plant wet to wet. 
It doesn't matter if it's a tree, if it's a house plant, or if it's a, a transplant of a vegetable plant. When we say wet to wet, what we really mean by that is that the receiving soil has to be really wet thoroughly. And then the pot of the plant that's gonna be transplanted has to be really wet as well. Why we do that? Roots don't like to be exposed to the air. And when plant moving it somewhere else, no matter what you do, there's gonna be a transplant shock because there's, this is new surroundings. The plant needs to read where am I might. Is, is that good, for, good enough for me? And um, if a plant um, placed under stress, that plant will take two to three weeks for it to get over the fact that I was moved somewhere else. And then you lose two to three weeks of growing season. So what you really wanna do is reduce that by making sure that anytime you plant uh, wet to wet, it's a very simple um, formula to remember and I always use it and always uh, teach it to other people who are planning to learn how to garden. The other thing is that when you do plant something, plants are living things. Just like you take care of your dog, you need to take care of your plant. You can't just plant something and walk away and then come back maybe in three months. You need to water it, keep it moist, keep, make sure that the area around the plant is uh, mulched. And also check your plants, see maybe if there is some insect or some disease that's creeping in, you wanna catch that problem early. Um, you don't wanna wait until it's too late and then all you have to do is just dig out the plant and put it in the trash. And again, I like to use uh, liquid seaweed and fish emulsion, uh, and this is a quick boost. Anytime I find my plants, you know, stressed out, just a quick addition of that, you know, diluted with water, it would have an immediate boost, um, uh, an immediate boost to your plants. Now, this is a planting guide that we in Copal Community Garden have compiled, and that was based on our own experience. We as gardeners, we got together, and we said to ourselves, what has really worked for us? and how and when. So we kept a log of uh, when, did, when it was the optimum time for plants uh, to go in. We did not go into uh, variety, but more into the type of plant. Like let's say the broccoli, we know when do we need to seed it, when do we need to transplant it, when do we need to harvest it, and do we need to thin it. Um, it's a great uh, tool that uh, we use in the garden, and it is also something that we give out to novice gardeners and believe me there, we've had gardeners who the only thing they've known when they first started is that the green side goes up and uh, right now they are professional gardeners and all they've, they've done is basically got their hands dirty that's all you need to do is just go out there and do it so this planting guide is very useful uh, for uh, for anybody uh, within the metroplex area obviously as you go move north or you move south the planting time will certainly uh, vary now, when, what do we do when you do have a problem? Uh, personally, I rarely have problems with my plants. And the reason for that is because we start them right. And when we say we start them right, is that we practice uh, sustainable practices as well as we are aware of the season and the changing uh, climate as well. And uh, what is very important is that when you grow something today, <coughs> next year you do not grow the same thing. And that's what we mean, uh, mean by crop rotation here. Unfortunately, many commercial uh, nurseries, um, uh, they grow the same thing year after year. You know, if they, they grow tomato, 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 because, well, gee, you know, I'm known to uh, be the biggest pro pro you know, producer of tomatoes, so I have to produce tomatoes. Well, when you do that, you're basically saying, well, let me marry my first cousin. Uh, and when that happens, you know you're going to have problems uh, here because you're, uh, you're going to uh, gonna have problems. You know, you'll have time. The pest will find you once you keep using the same thing. And then these tomatoes are going to deplete your soil. And on top of that, you'll find yourself that you are going to be spraying them with insecticides, uh, pesticides, herbicides, anything just to keep, it, keep those tomatoes growing. But at the same time, what are you getting? You're, you're getting uh, tasteless tomatoes that are very harmful for the body because you are eating uh, these insecticides and pesticides. Because I, I get annoyed when people say, well, plant doesn't know what's, what, what we're giving. And I said, yeah, but your body does. So you have to remember that when you do crop rotation like this year, I planted potatoes in the spring, regular potatoes. Now, uh, next spring, I'm going to be planting cucumbers or watermelons uh, or beans. I never uh, grow in the same spot the same thing. This way, you confuse the pest because they don't know where you're growing what, and you keep uh, moving things around. And that's, for me, it's a natural way of saying I, I practice pest control. 
The next one is, of course, uh, soil preparation. Again, I cannot re-emphasize that enough because if you have good soil, you have good plants. Uh, good plants don't make good soil. Okay. And again, you know, we, have, we talk about timing, which is very important because uh, you cannot plant, uh, you know, tomatoes and, uh, and um, uh, you know, and uh, eggplants or peppers, you know, in, in the winter time. You know, they need uh, soil temperature to go above 40 degrees for them to survive. And of course, they can't make it in the winter. You have frost or ice. And again, I like it plants for every season. You can never get bored because every season you're gonna have a different plant going up uh, in your yard. You're not gonna be looking at the same thing time after time. And then I also practice mechanical control. And what does really ma mean that if you have some, uh, occasionally you might have some uh, pests like the Colorado potato beetle or the squash bugs, these are big bugs. And if you're not so um, uh, squeezy about, uh, so nervous about it, I use a garden glove just pick them off the plant and I squish them. Um, that's the best thing you can do. And then if you have aphids, you know, which is um, you know, part of a power wash, I just use a hose and I just uh, hose the, the leaves and the aphids will, will fall and you're not gonna find them. If however, you're not very comfortable with mechanical control or power wash, there are some ingredients that I also use. Uh, the garlic pepper spray, which is here on the left, um, you can buy it as well, but uh, make sure that when you use it uh, that you have your face covered because they use habanero uh, peppers and then when you spray it's like, ugh, it really goes into your, uh, into your nostrils. But it really will smother um, the aphids, they just, they can't, they can't wait for that. And then also you have dipole dust and you have spinosad. All of these are made from plant material and uh, the uh, dipole dust actually it is made from the crustacean shells, it looks like powder to you, but it's actually like broken glass. So when the, um, they in the, the insects ingest that, it would just destroy their gut. So they, basically these are um, organic products. Again, I do not advocate a specific brand. It's just basically what works uh, for an organic gardener. What's that last one? Uh, on the right? Yeah. Spinosad. Spinosad. S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D. And it, it, is, it is just, it smothers the insects. It just basically um, chokes them to death. And the first one's for aphids? Uh, yes, garlic pepper uh, tea spray. Garlic pepper. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, last but not least, I provided these uh, websites. Um, uh, Renee Garden, it is a very good resource for people who are starting to garden because it gives you a guidance on when you can um, harvest, uh, the optimum time to harvest. Sometimes if you wait too long to harvest something, then probably it doesn't taste good or it tastes mushy. Or if you want to use uh, something like just, uh, you know, our next speaker is going to talk about canning. When is the optimum time to pick it up so you can use it for canning? Because for canning, you want something that is crunchy in your mouth. The second one is the Copal Community Garden website. It is, again, full of resources um, and information that would aid you uh, in getting your garden started, especially if you want to pursue vegetable and um, fruit planting. And the last one is the uh, Texas A&M website, and it gives you some guidance on the integrated best management system, as well as information on planting fruits and vegetables. Um, because here, the varieties do differ, and some varieties uh, do much better in Texas than they do uh, somewhere else. And also, if you want to pursue um, uh, fruit tree planting, uh, it is a great resource to have. Uh, and with um, Texas, we have great fruit trees uh, that you may want to consider also in the future. Once you start going with organic gardening and you're okay with vegetables and you want to, um, you know, go on into fruit trees, that's a great website uh, to get and also will give you resources on people that you can contact to get opinions about, you know, various varieties and whatnot. Now, I can stay here all day and talk to you about organic vegetables um, and fruit trees, but the truth of the matter is that you're not gonna learn and you're not gonna grow unless you go out there and do it yourself. And I always uh, tell people the best place to start is join a community garden or even start one. Um, and, you know, by doing, working together as a group, uh, not only do you add value to your community, but you also, um, 
acquire the knowledge that you need to, to garden, whether in your own backyard or to pass this knowledge on to other people, uh, just like I am doing here today, um, because I believe knowledge is as good as passing it on to others. So uh, basically, I conclude my presentation, and uh, thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Some questions, and uh -huh. I'm gonna, uh, Mary. I'm gonna have you come over here. Yes. And we're going to flip around and put in another PowerPoint while you're answering questions. Yes, please. Can I? Yes. Okay. You rotate uh, whatever you plant for veggies or vegetables, right? I uh, know. Yes. Would you repeat the question? Uh, she asked if uh, you only rotate vegetables, you don't rotate flowers, and I said, yeah, I, I don't rotate flowers because most of my flowers are perennials. They come back every year. Yes. On the coffee grounds, you put those on any time of the year on the roses? Any time of the year. Um, well, I like to usually put them in the spring and then the fall because usually in the spring because you want the, you know, to start making blooms. And in the fall because they get really stressed out with the summer, sometimes with this heat, I put them around. But I, you know, my neighbor, she puts them all year round. I mean, I compete with her coffee grounds. Mm -hmm. yeah. So did you put them directly on? Or Just around the soil. I mean, around the roots of the, of the rose. Yes. Sorry. Where can we find the site that tells what type of plants, fruits and vegetables you can grow in the shade? Uh, you can, well, no, but you can Google, like you say, if you say uh, plants for shade in Texas, uh, you will have a, a huge website uh, as well. Uh, the, but if you also go on the Texas A&M website and then you, you, say, you search or, you know, plants for shade, you will have a lot of them. But there are a lot of uh, shade plants that are suitable uh, here for Texas. Yes. Oh, I do. I use it for everything. But I, I pointed out the roses because I know a lot of people have uh, affinity for roses, which I do as well. But no, for anything, I, any any kind of uh, even trees, you know. But I just dump the coffee ground. They give you this huge bag. Uh, and you can use our own coffee that we now. Yeah, but you don't produce that much. But you know, like Starbucks or I don't know other coffee houses, they're happy to give it to you. I mean, instead of throwing them, they'll they'll load them they'll load them up for you. Yes. Yeah, I noticed. Uh, I see a lot of these things with the uh, schedule for planting plants. But what I never see is that nobody ever sits down and put the actual variety that will grow in a particular area. They'll always get the times and how long, but I never see the variety. Yeah, these, whatever varieties in that plant group, they will grow here very well. We don't mention varieties, it's because it, people are very specific in, in what they like. Like for me, for instance, I like the, uh, the flat cabbage head because, um, you know, coming from the Middle East, we use them for, to roll up and, and you suck them with rice and meat. But most people here in Texas, they like the round one because they use it as coleslaw as well as in salad. So it really depends on what you like. But any, I mean, even if you say, I, I want to grow eggplants, any of the eggplant families would grow very well here in Texas. So if this is more a generic, it will grow. Now, if you're going to go into ornamentals, then that's a different story. Then you, ha you have very specific variety for each ornamental. Yeah, re regarding the uh, putting the plants in different areas, I mean, if you're composting every year, aren't you really just replenishing the soil with the nutrients? Why is, would there be a need then to relocate the plant? To Very good place? question. Uh, first of all, when we add compost, usually you can't add more than three inches. I mean, unless you have huge amounts of compost. And the second one, any plant that you grow, it, it leaves its what we call the genetic footprint. It stays in the soil. And these are translated to nematodes. They stay in the soil. And they can be quite deep in the soil. And that's why when they will find your root. Once the, the plant root you know, grows deep, the nematodes of the previous plant will find it. And that will cause insects. Any other questions? Yes. Um, say you're, OK, because you keep adding the compost and all the good stuff. And you're adding nutrients back in the soil and you're composting it. Say if you don't do these things and, and you're growing something like the, the vegetables that you're growing, can they be less nutrient filled or more nutrient filled, or is it just not going to grow if there's not? I mean, like say you're getting one tomato versus another tomato. Does one have a lot more nutrients than another one? Does it work like that, or is it, is it just not going to grow if it doesn't have the nutrients? You know, you you can. I mean, you can decide. Uh, I've tried this experiment once. I've tried to. Uh, 
add it once, you just add nutrients once and not add anything and just keep planting. Eventually your plants are gonna get smaller and smaller and then they will become susceptible to diseases because there are not enough vitamins and nutrients for the new plant to draw from. So you can tell, I mean, because what I'm saying is sometimes I'm worried about like in a grocery store if it's not grown right. I mean, does it, does it have less nutrients maybe then? Or, or is it just not gonna grow if it doesn't have a No, it will not have like, strong. yeah, it will automatically will have less nutrients because it's gonna be smaller. Okay. Because you know, if you're if you're like this year, you had a tomato plant, and you got you got like let's say just for sake of an example, you got 20 tomatoes out of it. Next year, you plant tomatoes as well. You didn't add anything. You know, maybe you might get the, the same 20, but eventually it's gonna go down and down until okay. eventually you won't get any any food any any uh, fruit because these tomato plants will be diseased by then. Oh. So so if you're growing and it's coming up healthy, then it's got the nutrients. Yes, absolutely. Okay, one more question, and we go on to the next. If you had a window in your home that, that received, let's say, nine hours of sunlight per day, could, could you potentially grow a tomato plant indoor? It, it has to be direct sun. Direct sun, yes. If it is direct sun, yes, you can. Yeah. But it has to be direct. Be, having a well-lit you know, well uh, room is not going to make it unless you bring growing lights. Yeah. Uh, and these can be expensive because you have to keep them on all, all the time. Uh, to augment because it's nothing. It, growing lights, they are not. They're not going to be as good as the direct sun. So, 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 if that's the case, considering that you control the temperature in the house, right, the soil won't dry out as rapidly as it would outside. So, no. you could potentially grow it in maybe a seven-gallon pot as opposed to. Yes, a you can. Gallon. And actually, you, what you are, what you're saying is that you're mimicking a greenhouse. Yeah. Uh, so. you can certainly do that. Yes, absolutely. But what? My presentation was addressed to just general uh, conditions where we're talking about the outdoors. Uh, that's what you know what we're talking about. But if you want to create your own mini greenhouse, yeah, I don't see anything uh, wrong with that. And do you have any special techniques for attracting and keeping green lace wigs to, for insect control? Yes, uh, that's a very good question because a lot of people they go out to the store and they buy even. Uh, ladybugs and then uh, two days later they can't find them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not like they, you, they disappear or somebody stole them. They went somewhere else where there is food for them. If you don't have any uh, pests in your garden, um, those, uh, you know, those beneficial insects are going to go somewhere else. I mean, unless you have something that, you know, aphids uh, that's growing, that's going on, that the wasps need to eat the, eat the, the lace wings, they're not going to stay. They're, they need to eat. So unless you're going to keep them as pets and find uh, aphids for them, they're going to have to go somewhere else. Yeah. So, so I guess my question was, what would you do to help to attract those beneficial? Practice organic uh, control. And also when you do variety of planting, like don't just, just grow all tomatoes or all just peppers. It's boring. If you mix and match and you also mix in some, uh, um, you know, flowers um, as well in your area and some shrubbery, it will attract, uh, you know, I like lizards because lizards eat insects. Um, and they and they stay around in my yard. I see them all the time. So and there's a, there's a place for them to hide, uh, to forage, and and to and also you know when it gets very hot, they just get under the mulch and they stay there until you know it cools off. So basically, if you do all that, I mean, all I say is that the simple thing to do is just emulate the forest. The forest has all these you know little animals and, and insects uh, and whatnot if you emulate the forest you'll be in good shape and then you would not have to worry about well i need to go to the store to get these thank you okay right. thank you thank you, so much. Thank you. Is that mine? our final speaker and this uh, this whole day has just been amazing to me i, I hope you all have been learning a lot uh, about these things and just kind of getting your appetite wet about what's to come. Our final speaker is on food preservation and canning and she's got a really great presentation. This is Trish Percy with Feed Texas First. And we've been sitting in the back. She's been telling me about all sorts of great resources for more speakers to come. So I'm, I'm really happy to meet everybody. It's really been fun. So Trish, it's, uh, it's all yours. Thank you. I wanted to tell you a little bit about my organization and it, it came out of um, my sister's farm up in Ponder because when she started her blackberry farm we realized that she didn't have any resources, she couldn't find any help and she also couldn't find someone who was doing what she was doing that she could talk to and bounce ideas off of. So 
we looked at the food security that is in this, in this area, and it's actually really low. We don't grow a lot. We don't feed ourselves. Most of what we eat is coming from California or South America or Mexico. And we want that to change. We want that to change through people growing their own. We want it to change through more farmers. We want it to change through food policy um, taking place here in North Texas that allows people to keep chickens, that allows um, school, independent school districts to say, we have a 20% local procurement policy. Because if that policy, if that policy is there, then the farmers will have a, um, they'll have a market for what they're growing and will be able to get more farmers because they have to be able to sell what they have. So anyway, just so that you know where I'm coming from. Today we're going to talk about um, canning and food preservation. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is why. Why do we can? Um, do any of you have any food allergy issues? Anything like that? Gluten or soy, something like that? Um, my issue has come up with gluten, and when you start looking at things, um, canned food on the shelf, a lot of it has wheat in it, and they put it in food starch and just, just about everything. And when you can it yourself, you have complete control over what you put in there. So you know that what you're getting is going to be clean for you. <coughs> Additionally, you know where your food comes from because you either purchased it from a known source or you grew it yourself. So you don't have to be concerned about pesticides or chemicals or anything like that that's on there that you didn't know about. You want control over your food supply, and that's really what we're concerned with in North Texas right now. Um, canning is not something that you want to memorize and then you know it, because things change, and if you forget a step, it could be something that could make your family sick. So what I always recommend is buy this book. <laughs> You can buy it for $6.50 online. Every Ace Hardware and Turner Hardware has it. I have a copy of it. I'll be happy to pass it around if you guys would like to take a look. Um, they have a 1-800 number that you can call. It's right inside the front cover, and they will be happy to help you if you ever have an issue. But the reason we say don't memorize is the steps have to happen in a certain way, and every recipe that you get, canning recipes are different from cooking recipes. When you have a canning recipe, it tells you the steps. It tells you exactly what to do, when to add things, what the processing time is, and you want to make sure that you always follow it. So follow the recipes and don't, don't deviate, especially not if you're a new canner. Once you've been canning for a couple years and you have a good feeling for what you're doing, then you can start experimenting. But in, at first, absolutely not. You want to just follow the recipes. These recipes have all been tested. Another thing I found is, is you keep hearing a reference to pickling salt, and you'll, you'll find it in this ball book as well. And they don't always explain what it is. It's just salt that does not have iodine in it. So you can just go and buy that Morton non-iodized salt. You can use sea salt. You can just do that. Um, you don't have to buy a special pickling salt that's more expensive. Okay. Food, there's a lot of different food preservation methods, and one of the easiest is actually freezing, and I'd like to talk about that first. I know it's down here on my list, but um, tomatoes. Everybody likes to do something with tomatoes, and you usually get a whole ton of them at one time. And what I like to do, if I don't have time to actually use them in a salad or eat them fresh, I just stick them on a tray in the freezer whole. And the really nice thing about that is that when you pull them out and thaw them out, the skin comes right off as soon as they thaw. You don't have to peel them. It's really wonderful. Now, if you're, you won't be able to use them in a salad or anything like that if you're putting them in the freezer. You're going to need to use them in a sauce or like a tomato sauce or something like that because the freezing changes the texture. Um, but again, I'm sorry, you, soup. Soup is fabulous for that because it, they get a mushy texture when you freeze them, but it doesn't matter in a soup. It actually makes it easier. So hot water bath canning is canning where you are taking something and putting it in a, in a hot water bath for a certain amount of time and then letting it cool and that process is creating a vacuum in your jar. <laughs> Pressure canning is um, putting it in a canner, closing it up and actually raising the pressure to where it increases the temperature much more than you could get with a um, hot water bath canner. Um, 
I think it's 212, 212 degrees for a hot water bath canner, and it's, it's a lot more for a pressure canner. So anytime that you are doing anything that is, would be considered low acid, like meat, or just a regular vegetable that's not a high acid, like a tomato, um, you would need to pressure can it, which is why I'm going to be mostly talking about hot water canning today, because that is the easiest thing to start with. Um, have any of you ever done dehydrating or anything like that? Okay. We're gonna, hopefully we'll be able to talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, refrigerator pickling is an easy thing to do as well because you can um, prepare your food, put it in a jar, put the vinegar and the um, condiments in there as well, and it's going to take care of itself. You don't have to can it. But again, that's not going to keep for six months, eight months. It's, you're going to be eating it more or less quickly. Um, and lacto-fermentation. This is, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I turned it off. There we go. Um, Lacto-fermentation, this right here, this is the truly sustainable method for preserving food. So as you get going, please take a look at this. This is the stuff that you can can on your countertop with no hot water, no refrigeration, no nothing. Um, if any of you have ever had kombucha, or kimchi or anything like that. A lot of native traditional foods are done this way. And the reason they were done this way is because they were done before um, refrigeration was available. Uh, okay. Safe. I don't have anything in there, but if you, I would love for you to look it up. It's something, it, it, it's kind of um, intimidating when you start because you're taking food and I know we've been told forever that we don't do this. We don't leave food on the counter. But you are putting it on your counter and you're leaving it there for days, maybe weeks. And it's not going to go bad. <laughs> okay? So I will talk about that a little bit at the end, just to kind of give you some resources. But um, we want to talk about the hot water canning first. Um, if you have not ever canned before, I don't recommend that you have small children around when you do it because you are dealing with a big, huge pot of boiling water and hot glass jars and hot um, jam or whatever, it's not a good idea to have distractions around when you're doing it for the first time. Once you're comfortable, that's great. I know a lot of people have maybe have memories of canning with their grandmother and it was wonderful, but that grandmother had probably been canning for years and knew exactly what she was doing. Um, broken jars can be a really big deal too, especially if you're dealing with a pressure canner, but once you've had some experience, it becomes something that's just, you just deal with it and it's not a big deal. Um, splatter burns can be a really big deal, especially with a small child, and you have to be careful um, with you as well because some of these jams, when you put the um, um, serto or the pectin in, it creates, it gels it, and when they splatter, it can really, really hurt. So be careful. So the equipment that we use, and I'll give you a cost benefit breakdown here. Um, this is a hot water bath canner. You don't have to buy this. All you really need is a big pot and you can make your own tray in the bottom. Um, the way I've made my own tray is to take the, the, um, the screw on lids that you use. You just put them together with twist ties and set them in the bottom and you can put, set your jars on that and use that instead of this. But this runs about $25 at Turner Hardware, Ace Hardware. You're also going to need a small saucepan for your lids. Jars and lids, you can see there's your um, ring. I'm, I'm having a complete brain cramp here. And there's your lid. And these are all different sizes. You, can, you should be able to find a jar to fit what you want to do. Little, big, wide mouth, small mouth. Um, make sure that, that the jar that you're using is appropriate. Because it, if, if you get a quarter, a gallon sized jar of jam, Sometimes it's really hard to use it all before it goes bad. <laughs> okay. um, I have found this, and I really love it. This is a, uh, a canning funnel, and it is actually collapsible, so it's flat in my drawer, and I don't have to keep it around because usually they're, um, they're about this big, and they, they're just too deep for the drawers. So that one I found at Turner Hardware. This is a jar lifter. You absolutely have to have one of those. There's just no other way to get those jars out of that canner without burning yourself. And then this is a really nice to have thing because um, when you put your 
your um, lids in that saucepan and keep them hot, you have to be able to get them out so you can put them on your jars. And that's, it has, it's a little piece of plastic with a metallic or a um, magnet on the end and it just picks them right up for you and sets them right on there so you don't have to burn your hand and that's like a buck. You also need a non-metallic spatula uh, and a cutting board or a heat proof surface and um, part of the reason for the heat proof surface is when you take that jar out you don't want to set it on a cold countertop because the quick change in temperature can make it crack. Okay so here's our equipment cost breakdown. Um, about $25 for the canner, that's what I paid for mine at Ace Hardware. You can get your jar lifter, your canning funnel, your lid lifter, your blue book. You should be able to find those jars anywhere for a buck a piece. Um, Turner Hardware has, you can actually buy individual jars at a dollar a piece, but they also sell them by the dozen. And they have a really good selection of the types of jars. And then if we look at what you can can, what can you can? Um, in terms of hot water bath canning, you're only going to be wanting to do high acid foods. So we're talking jams, jellies, pickles, something like that. You can can almost any vegetable in a hot water bath if you pickle it because the vinegar is raising that acidity level. And you always want to make sure that the acid level is high for these. So. Um, the first thing that you want to do is you want to prep your jars. And I always like to do, to do this. Not everybody washes their jars. Some people put them in the dishwasher. But I like to do it this way because I just run my finger along the, the rim of the jar. And it tells you right there if there's any um, imperfection in the top that will affect the seal. Because if it won't seal, you can't put it in the cupboard when you're done. Um, once you're done doing that, you wash and rinse them. Um, and you're going to take them and you're going to put them in that canner and you're going to fill it with water and bring it to a simmer. And the reason for that is we want to keep the jars warm the whole time so that when we put a hot um, vegetable or jam in them, they won't crack. Okay, and again, you're going to keep these hot until you're ready to use them, and you're going to use that little lid lifter. Is it just called lid, lid lifter? It's called a lid lifter or a magnetic wand. I've seen it both. Magnetic both wand? wand. Jars that are in the staying warm, they're filled up with water. The yes. inside of them are also filled with water. Yes. To dump them out. You don't have to put them in here. You can just put them in another big pot. If you have a lot of stuff that you're canning, if you have just loads of stuff, you're not going to want to do it this way. And the reason is that you're going to be um, rotating stuff through, and you can't be keeping the, the empty bottles warm in there while you're getting ready to do another load. Okay. So it's kind of like laundry. Um, you would want to have a big stock pot and just put all your, all your bottles in there and keep them warm and then use this just to can instead of keeping them warm. Okay, so prep your food. Mary uh, made reference to this. When you can, you are canning the best of what you have. You do not take something that's mushy or soft or has brown spots or anything like that. You always want to can the best stuff. So once, while your cans are in that canner and, they're, and they are um, heating up, you're going to prep your food, and you're going to cook it if you need to. Um, this actually was a, um, was a batch of pickled, pickled green beans that I did. Remember, follow the recipe exactly. And once you've done that, you're going to pull your jars out. You're going to fill them. You're going to place them on that cutting board so that they won't crack, because it's not going to conduct the heat or the cold. Um, fill them using the funnel. And always be aware of the headspace. Headspace is a canning term that has to do with the top of the food to the top of the jar. And again, every recipe will tell you exactly what headspace you need. It'll say half space or a half inch or an inch. And um, you are going to remove the air bubbles from every jar. Once you've filled it, you'll take that me non-metallic spatula we talked about that's part of the, part of the list. You're going to go down around the sides and you're going to get rid of air bubbles. Once you've done that, usually it drops, and you'll be amazed at how much it will drop, and then you may need to add a little more. All right, so make sure that you maintain the, the headspace. Um, and then once you've done that, you're going to need to clean those rims. And that's where the funnel really helps, because if you don't have a funnel, you end up getting stuff all over the rims, and it can affect your seal. So we always want to clean the rims to make sure that we'll get that seal. And you're going to use your wand, pull that out, stick the lid on the jar, 
and then screw it down, not too tight. The reason for not screwing it down too tight is when that, um, the material that's in your jar is boiling in the canner, it vents. Air is going to vent out, and if you have it too tight, it won't vent. Because what we want it to do is vent out so that we can create that vacuum as soon as it starts to cool. Well, have you ever noticed that, that the level is sometimes lower when they're done? Yeah. Okay, you have had some, some liquid that's vented out and also the air is venting out the top. Because as it heats up, it's expanding and it has to come out, yeah. right? If you have it screwed on too tight, it can't. So you, wanna, you, you want it finger tight, but not so tight that nobody would ever be able to get it off because you, it needs to be able to vent a little bit. Right, but that doesn't matter because you can pick it up, right, without it. it does, that, that doesn't even matter anymore. Okay. And we're going to talk about the fact that when you store them, you really shouldn't store them with the rings on. Yeah. People think that that's strange, but you should take them off because if it's going to pop, you would like it to pop. You want to know. Okay, so once you've got, once you've got everything in those jars, you're going to put them in the canner and you're going to make sure that it's covered by two to three inches of water. So again, if you want to use a really big um, pot, you don't have to use that canner. Just make sure it's big enough that whatever jar you have, you can cover by two to three inches, okay? Then you're gonna cover it and bring it to a boil and process it for the time that's listed on the recipe. Um, and again, the processing time does not start until it's boiling. Okay, so not just when you put it in, but make sure that it is at a full boil before you start your timer. <coughs> and that's what it looks like when they're covered. I think you can see that. So again, think of this as a safety concern because if you happen to knock it and you have a small child around, it could be really disastrous. So once you've, once you've completed your processing time and you're going to cool those jars, you just want to turn off the heat Remove the lid and let it sit for five minutes. And the reason for that is to let everything inside those jars stabilize. The pressurization needs to stabilize. And then you're gonna take the jars out one by one using that jar lifter and set them on that um, heat proof surface. I was always taught not to tilt them when you bring them out because that can change the pressure in the jar. So I always just lift them straight out, set them on the counter and then leave them alone. Uh, the nicest thing when you're doing this is just hearing that ping. Do you like to listen to the ping? Kind of makes you feel like you did something right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it can take a couple hours sometimes for that ping to actually happen and for the seal to take. So don't, don't fuss if it doesn't happen right away. Um, once it's pinged and cooled, you should be able to take off that screw cap and lift the jar by the lid without the screw cap on. And if you can't do that, then it has not sealed. And if it hasn't sealed, don't worry, you can either process it again or you can just put it in the fridge and eat it. Use it as something that you've just opened. Sometimes we don't want to process them again because that's going to degrade what we have. Like if you have just pickled green beans, you don't really want to put them in the processor again because when you do that, they get mushy. It's another 10 minutes in boiling water. Okay. Canning from your garden is a really big deal. And I don't know about you, but there's times when I have grown things in my garden and I pull them out and I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to eat it. I don't know, don't know what to do with it. And I end up not using it. And if you have a garden and you're growing, it is such a shame to not be able to actually eat what you're growing. So we like to stagger our plantings because we, like if you have tomatoes, you know everybody gets a ton of tomatoes all at the same time. Um, we always get cilantro, radishes, we like to stagger them, plant them like every week so that you get, you get them as you go along uh, rather than getting everything at one time. And, and usually we do. We just plant everything and we're done. But it comes back to haunt us when we actually um, can. Be prepared. Keep your eye out for recipes. There's some great, great websites I'm going to give them to you at the end that you can check out. Um, and don't be afraid to try something new because you, end up might like, might, you might not like it, but it might be the best thing you've ever had, too, because some of those canning recipes are so fabulous. I have a friend that made me some pickled radishes and onions, and I kind of was like, oh, but oh, it was so good. <laughs> I've been fighting my husband off. 
because he wants to eat them all. Okay. Some of the resources that I like to use, there's one called Grow It, Cook It, Can It. These should be on your handout, I think. They're on the second page. And one of the ones that's on there recently is how to preserve 100 pounds of tomatoes with almost no work. And sometimes you'll, if you plant a lot of tomatoes, you may get that much at one time. And that's when you want to make sure that you're either freezing them or you're canning them quickly so that you have them later. Oh, and if you've frozen them, you can can them later. You can just throw them in the freezer and then pull them out and defrost them and can them when you have time. So it can be a great time saver. Um, Hitchhikingtoheaven.com, this lady is a award-winning jam and jelly maker, and she has caramel apple jam on there right now that just looks to die for. So I would definitely check that one out. And Punk Domestics is kind of a collector website. Lots of different people who can put re can and preserve put recipes on there, and they do all kinds of preserving, not just canning. Um, so that is a great one to look at. They have a pickled zucchini. I don't know about you guys, but my zucchini is producing a lot right now with the cool weather. I managed to keep it alive over the summer. It managed. I don't know how, but it, all of a sudden it's, it, it's producing a lot. Okay, so we have this blue ball, Guide to Preserving. That's the one that's going around. They also have a big hardcover, and it's the Ball Complete Book of Home Preserving, and that's that book in a little more detail. But again, this is the one that we're recommending. And then this book, the Big Book of Preserving the Harvest, that's where the recipe for the pickled onions and radishes is. So I will let you know, that is this one. They might be, they might be. This is a really cool one that I found. Top 50 websites for learning self-canning. And there is, there's just so much information out there on the web right now. And good luck. This is, this is something we made this summer. This is a pickled relish. It's, it's green peppers and cucumbers, red peppers. Oh, it was fabulous. But something to think about, um, I bought some Cuc er, yeah, cucumber salad from Whole Foods the other day and I got it home and it was nasty. If you have cucumbers, when the weather changes, they get bitter. So when you're canning, when you cut the top off that cucumber, lick it. Because you don't want to be putting all that work into something that's going to be awful at the other end. And I had not realized until this past year that that was, that was an issue, but we got a bad one and you'll know right away. <laughs> um, Lacto-fermentation, I want to bring up, bring up a little bit about that. That is, I made some a couple weeks ago. I made a ginger carrot lacto-fermentation. You basically put it all in a jar, and I was not using whey, which is what they usually use. It's a milk product. Um, I used salt, because you can do it with salt. So I had ginger and salt and carrots. That's all that's in it, and it's fabulous. Sat on my, on my counter for three days, and then I put it up in the top of my refrigerator. And it's pretty darn good. It has an interesting flavor, but it's basically self-preserving. I have a question. My grandmother always made her jelly and jams and put paraffin. That, that's, some people still do that. I've never done that. They, you, the USDA will tell you they don't recommend it. But I know a lot of people have done it for years and years and years and not necessarily gotten, it, gotten sick from it. I've eaten jam like that before. If she gives you some, I would take it and eat it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm always being leery. Well, you know, after a certain time, I thought, well, you know, it should be eaten. It's not properly I would. Okay. <laughs> if she's been doing it for years and nobody's ever gotten sick, I would. Yes? I have two questions. Does that lactose fermentation work with meat? And the, the question was, does the lacto-fermentation um, work with meat? And I don't know. I've never done it that way. No. Okay. I think it's a, I think it's a vegetable or grain because, I mean, sourdough is a, is a, is a lacto-fermentation type of thing. You're, you're fermenting the yeast. Do you offer classes? I do offer classes. I will be happy to um, give you my card. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. It was, it was uh, grated ginger, carrots, and then uh, I used sea salt. 
And it actually feels like an enormous amount of salt, but it's really not. Oh, it's probably two to four tablespoons. Did you put water in it? No, I did not. And the reason I didn't is that you take it and you pound it down. You mix everything and you pound it, you macerate it to release the juices. And then you just push it down in the jar so that it's underneath the juices with the salt. And that preserves it. Yes. No, you don't want to reuse those lids. Um, don't, there, don't. There is a reusable lid. There, there, yeah, there may be. There, there's a company that makes specifically reusable ri lids, guaranteed for everything. You're, you're not supposed to reuse the, 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 lid, the ceiling lids, but you know what I tend to do is I've written on them so I know they've been used, and I put them in another jar, and I use them because I also use those jars to keep um, pasta and grains and things in, and I use them for that once I've canned with them. So they do get another life but I just don't can with them again. And if you want to keep you know, taking large volumes of jars and keep them going, could you do that in the oven? Keep Absolutely, the oven? I have done that. Some people tell me it's not recommended, but I have done that. You set, your, um, you set your oven to about 180, I think, and you just set them in there. Sometimes it can be a little difficult getting them in and out, but it does work, and I have done it that way. Oh, he asked if you... Yeah, you can keep you can keep your jars warm in the oven. And you had a question? And I, I don't know much about canning. I'm just learning. But um, there's a Yahoo group. It's called Canning Two on Yahoo. And canning the mineral two. And you post a question there, and we have all these people that must can like 24/7 because they just like write back and answer questions. So that to me. That 1-800 number. The 1-800 number for ball canning too. They'll be happy to give you an answer. You don't have to like prove that you bought their book or anything. <laughs> and um, Garden Inspirations in Waxahachie, they do vegetable gardening and all that, but they also have a canning club. And it's great for a beginning canner because um, you get to go with a bunch of people. So it's not all by yourself, which can be kind of intimidating if you've never done it. Mm -hmm. They get filled up pretty quick. Yeah. We do have a class that's going to be offered and Trish has actually started sending me these sources for me to source out speakers. And uh, we do have the, the canning and preserving class that's going to be at Heritage Senior Center in the kitchen. So we can actually do some real stuff and, and watch. So that will have some limited seating because I can't, you know, cram in this size of class in there. Well, it wouldn't be any good because they wouldn't be able to see everything. Yeah, because you need to be able to do it. You need to take part in it and actually do it. You will be able to, that's on the handout, you'll be able to register online starting the It, it, you're, it, you're basically boiling it in that jar. It may change it. Is there a lot of vinegar in it? Well, I'll add vinegar to the hot sauce. No, I okay. just make hot sauce and I like the flavor whenever I've got it. But then somebody said, your hot sauce is wonderful. You need to sell it. And why would I sell it? I said, I don't think it would taste the same. You know, you might try it. You might can a batch of it and just see, see what you get. I don't know. And know the rules about selling. <laughs> yes, there are some selling cottage, cottage your material. food laws have changed, and you can actually sell something that you've can, you know, grown and canned, and that. Um, but there are there laws are rules about that. and regulations. Do you have one? Um, first thing is I follow the recipe, make sure that I've got the processing time correct. Second, I make sure I don't have anything, um, everything I put in that jar is good. I'm not putting soft spots or brown spots or anything like that in there. Um, I'm also making sure that it's sealing properly. There's really not much else you can do. The jar is hot and sterile. Yes, the jar is hot and sterile. You have to figure, you're getting exactly what you're getting when you buy a can at the grocery store. Um, except that you did it yourself, and every now and then there's a bad can. So when you open it, you better hear that puff, just like when you open one from the grocery store. Yeah, yeah, because it's there's a vacuum. If you don't hear a vacuum when you open it, then there's something wrong with it, and I would. The same eat is it. true from the grocery store. If exactly. you have a swollen can, I mean, you're going to notice, or you should be no looking yeah. at those things. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know that I would waste my money because, I mean, yeah. if you pop that top and you don't hear, I mean. Yeah. Well, and I will tell you about jars. If you are going out and buying a fresh batch of jars like at Walmart or something, and I came across this and I was really floored. It was ball uh, jars, and I'm sure this happens just in packaging, but there was broken glass in a jar. So wash your you glasses. Wash them. wash them first before you use them. I, I double wash them when I saw that. <laughs> and you just you don't know. So definitely inspect the jars. Oh, and um, some people like to collect them and go to garage sales and get them. Please don't use the vintage canning jars because you don't know what they've been through. You don't know if they have a weak spot, especially if you're pressure canning because you have a jar explode in a pressure canner. It's really a bad thing. All right. Well, we've come to the end of the line. Thank you so much to Trish. Thanks. And to Mary, and I guess Mary scooted out, but th that was a fabulous presentation, wasn't it? She's oh, wonderful. my goodness. Wonderful. Trish, you were wonderful. Thank you all so much for coming out.